Yeah, just waiting for the countdown. I wish it was a countdown. It would be far easier. Yeah. It's just a, a line that speeds up or slows down. Okay, tell me when. I think that's us. We're away. Are we ready to go? Ready to go. Countdown. I wish it was a countdown. It would be far easier. Yeah. It's just a, a line that speeds up or slows down. Good evening from Table Tennis Scotland. My guest tonight is a former Scottish international and a national champion. Over the past 50 years, he has seen and played against the best. Mm. Brian was one of the pioneers of developing coaching and a coaching scheme in Scotland and led the way to modern, modern coaching. When Brian's close friend, John Hilton, won the European Championships in 1980, he was a vital sparring partner. His coaching influence in England cannot be underestimated. Uh, he has worked alongside all the national coaches of the day. Brian, welcome back to Scotland. Thank you very much, David. Good to be with you. Good. Once again, I've got national selector and former Scottish international Mark Longberg, and he will have been doing his research and he'll be asking you some difficult questions. And we rely totally on Matt Norbury, and he'll be keeping us right on YouTube. Okay, Brian, you've got sporting genes in the family. That's crystal clear to me. But not necessarily good geography. Now, I just don't know whether I should be wearing the Knox County scarf, who have just made it to the playoff, or the Nottingham Forest shirt. I'm utterly confused. And can you help me, Brian? Notts Forest and Notts <laughs> County. Ah, um, yeah, it's easy to get confused between the two. Uh, interestingly, my uh, my father was um, was quite a prominent footballer. Yeah, he uh, played for the British Army and was playing in the Midlands and the scouts from the you know leading professional clubs always used to watch them and he was approached and invited to go along and uh, have a trial with um, one of the Nottingham clubs. I'm using the words Nottingham clubs at the moment in the plural sense. He, because the clubs, as you will know, David, um, are both geographically very closely linked. My dad went along to the club and uh, introduced himself to the coaching staff on this particular morning for his uh, trial. And they couldn't work out who it was that had sent him. Um, and my dad didn't even remember the guy's name. But they said, well, while you're here, what's your name anyway? He said, Tommy Keane. He said, right, Tommy, while you're here, you might as well join in, yeah? So the bottom line is he, uh, he did join in. He got invited to go back again. And then eventually they signed him, yeah? So he played for Nottingham Forest, yeah? And uh, he played a few reserve league matches. And uh, then I think he got selected for the first team. And when he came off the pitch this particular day, there was this guy stood there, um, you know, really quite uh, quite upset and saying, what the hell are you doing playing for this lot? And my dad then recognised him. He said, what do you mean? He said, I told you, right, that I wanted you to come along to Notts County, not Notts Forest. Um, and of course, my dad geographically had got confused, gone into the wrong place, played for the forest uh, and yeah, they signed them. So Notts County uh, were none too pleased about that. So that, that was the back. It, it actually was uh, quite interesting because it, it pleased my grandfather very much. Although we were all Scots, my grandfather came from Long Eaton 
and uh, he was uh, a long-suffering forest fan. And then since I got married to uh, my wife, who came from Derby, don't ask me why, but her family were all forest fans living in Derby. So there's the uh, there's that little bit of a connection with uh, Forest and County. Nothing much to do with football, that Markham, and with table tennis, Mark. I'm sorry, but uh, just uh, a little bit of uh, an interesting story. I just enjoyed a bit of long-suffering Knott's Forest fans, and now it's back over to Dave. <laughs> they are they are suffering today, aren't they? After the, yeah. the last. We are indeed, so, we are indeed. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm even more confused, Brian, because um, normally we, we we interview Don Parker or Jill Parker and Ewan Walker, and they all say how much they got into table tennis and they loved it. But a young 15-year-old Brian Keane turned his back on table tennis. Tell us about that. Ah, uh, well... Um... I uh, I was a, a member of the, the North Merkiston Club, yeah, and uh, my principal interest uh, in the days that I was there was football, quite obviously, but very much gymnastics, and uh, quite proud of the fact that uh, the North Merkiston Boys Club gymnastic team we won the National Boys Club Championships in Scotland about three years on the trot. Um, went to the nationals, uh, the UK nationals, uh, and always finished in about the top three or four. But one particular night, I was just about to leave the club when a um, good friend of mine who was a, a, an acting leader called Alan McKean, Alan said, uh, shouted out as I was at the door saying, Keen, where are you gone? I said, uh, I'm going home, why? He said, you're no. He said, I want you downstairs now. He said, the final of the Edinburgh Boys Club Table Tennis Championships are being played by Murdo McLeod and Charlie Vesco. And uh, the name Charlie Vesco was, uh, even although, you know, I didn't have an interest in table tennis, the name Charlie Vesco was quite prominent as he often used to pop up in the local, uh, local papers. So I, um, I bit the bullet and uh, because Alan had wanted the, you know, the club to support the event, I, I went downstairs, I watched the match, uh, Charlie beat this uh, Murdo McLeod. I thought it was all right, but uh, it didn't particularly float my boat to the point where I suddenly ran out and bought bats and uh, started playing regularly. So that was me, you know, one of my first introductions to the game. And just recently, the, uh, apparently the, Man the, the Edinburgh Evening News were running a feature on Remember When? Is that, I think that's correct, isn't it? Yes, indeed. And this was another occasion when Alan McKean nobbled me again to join them down at King Stables Road, the church there, because there was an exhibition going on there um, between uh, Bertie Kerr, um, a legend of table tennis in Scotland, obviously, and uh, another guy called David Hogg, who was a leading player. So I went along that particular night to watch that. Very interestingly, um, when I went into the room, I immediately recognised David Hogg, yeah, um, because David was um, a very, very good amateur footballer, and he played for my dad's amateur football team um, in the east of Scotland. So I knew David, um, and uh, I, you know, spent a couple of hours there watching table tennis, but um again didn't really you know spur me on to uh picking up the bat very much at um at the murky right so um you're not there you are in edinburgh i believe you went to school with tom hook as well just by sheer coincidence tom hook uh, huh? yeah that's right isn't it but then um your dad your traveling dad the forest player um, you moved to Manchester, and that's where your table tennis career began. That's, that's correct. 
We, um, as a family, we, <clears throat> my father and my older brother, uh, they worked in the newspaper industry. They worked for the Evening Dispatch. Uh, and at that time, I had just started as a 15-year-old at the Scottish Daily Mail in Tanfield, Edinburgh. And the evening papers were uh, going through a difficult time because there were two evening papers in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Evening News and the Evening Dispatch. And there were rumours flying around about it, uh, you know, one of them probably closing. So um, to cut it short, my dad decided there was plenty of work in uh, Manchester in the newspaper trade. So we up sticks and uh, 1963, we moved down as a family um, to live uh, in Manchester. And it was at the Daily Mail in Manchester where um, some of the, the guys that I was working with um, asked, you know, what interests I had. And I told them I was, you know, very sporty. Um, I loved my sport. And they recommended that I went to Manchester YMCA, uh, which interestingly was just round the corner from uh, the Daily Mail offices. So I, uh, I popped in there one particular night and uh, asked if I could have a, a, a look round the building. And I have to say, apart from table tennis, it was an absolutely magnificent uh, sports centre, that. It was on about four or five floors and, you know, virtually any sport you wanted, you could have got. And <clears throat> they produced a lot of great internationals in varying sports. And... One of the, on the tour that I, I was given, um, obviously I went through the table tennis room uh, before I went up to the gym and the running track and the pool. And uh, I have to say, when I looked at the table tennis in there, there was uh, five tables and there must have been about five or six people all sat um, at each table, all waiting their turn to play. And the table that I saw then, the table tennis I saw then, it really did catch my eye. It, uh, it was just like nothing I'd seen before, not being disrespectful to the bit that I'd seen with Bertie and Davy Hogg, uh, or even Charlie Vesco, but um, I was very impressed. So anyway, when the tour was finished, uh, I just asked the, uh, the guy that took me around if it would be all right to go up and just watch a bit more of the table tennis. That's what I did. Um, I sat there for an hour that night watching it. And then I used to have my lunch breaks uh, at the Daily Mail and decided, because the, the building was open from 9 till 10, uh, 9 in the morning straight through to 10 o'clock at night, I used to take my sandwiches over and uh, sit down and uh, just watch uh, the table tennis that went on then. And then it was just a wee, gradual sort of process. One day, somebody asked me if I wanted to, to have a wee hit and uh, he gave me a bat and I just started hitting the, you know, the ball and having a wee bit of fun. And then just gradually, the uh, I got the bug. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, you know, where I, if you like, really got my introduction to the, the game properly. Is it any special mention for anybody um, or were there any players at the Manchester YMCA at the time who sort of gave you a little bit of extra encouragement or were you very much fending for yourself? Oh, the, um, I mean, at, at the time, I, I did, when I just walked into that building, I mean, they just looked like good players and, you know, exceptionally good players. Um, but uh, I didn't know who was who really. Um, until I then started playing a bit myself, and then I realised that God, these were these were some of the leading players in the country, where and had been. There were players like um, Jeff Ingber, and I mean I know some of these names may not mean a lot to people, you know, north of the border. Uh, Jeff was England number two, um, regular international. Derek Schofield, always in the top ten in England. Um, Kevin Forshaw, um, probably an underrated player, um, Lancashire number one and had wins over Dennis Neal, England number one in, the, in tournament finals. There were players like Roy Crosham, uh, Benny Kosofsky, uh, George Goodman. Um, I mean, it just went on and on. They, you know, and there was just so many other players 
but we were county players, but not necessarily England players. But uh, there was a George Livesey that you may remember, England number one junior, Bryn Farnworth, you know, Lancashire number three or four. So it was just a hotbed of table tennis talent. And the YM had quite a unique system. Uh, the five tables were unofficially graded. So what you did was you decided what table uh, suited your standard and you would then go and sit and wait your turn. And all that they ever did was played winner stay on. Mm. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. sorry, I missed that day. Uh, no, exactly the same. Exactly the same at Nottingham YMCA. Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah. It was winner stay on. And what that did, it... Uh, if, I mean, particularly once I got into that and I went over at lunchtime uh, to have a game, um, I had a, a, an hour. I used to pinch an extra half hour by going in early to get a longer lunch to make it an hour and a half uh, break. Um, if, I, if I went in there and I found that there were three people waiting, right, uh, and I'd sit down and my turn would come, and if I lost... Chances were that that's the only game I would have got in that, you know, that hour. And I was back into the changing room, getting my clothes on and running back to the, the office. So what it did, it, uh, it really created a fantastic competitive attitude. Yeah. There was no coaching as such, but the best coaching you can get is to look at the best players and just basically copy them. Yeah, you if you can if you can uh, um, absorb exactly what they're doing and look at their technique and try to emulate that. Um, that was the way that all these YM players uh, used to work, uh, and the success of guys at uh, the YM in terms of the tournaments that they used to win around the country, players like Nigel Eckersley that you will know, Tony Bozeman, Phil Bowen, um, they were just, uh, you know, they were fantastic guys to to be practising against all the time. Yeah, It's like scarlet fever, isn't it? It spreads. You know, oh, it? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you, uh, what it did, it... Um, it really, it really gave you a mental toughness, um, and uh, that's you know stood all the YM guys in great stead. Um, they were all quite, you know, as I say, very, very mentally strong. But <clears throat> the other other aspect to it um, was that um, because of the intensive training regime that prevailed upstairs in the gymnasium which involved some of um, the country's best wrestlers, judo players, uh, runners. Um, it, um, that uh, training regime that we used to go through um, was, uh, was really quite uh, rigorous. And that added to the, you know, your mental strength, et cetera. And, you know, obviously my best mate, John Hilton, uh, John was a gymnast as well. Uh, John and I used to spend quite a lot of time up there, you know, on the, the gymnastics side as well as playing the table tennis. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, when I look around nowadays, um, I don't think, uh, certainly a lot of parents don't really appreciate that there's no shortcuts to, uh, to you getting your success. Um, as a coach, I'm often asked if I can uh, take, you know, do a bit of a coaching job with kids. And the first question I ask is usually, how much time have you got to practice? Um, <clears throat> and when I look back, we would be playing <clears throat> certainly 25 hours a week. No question. I mean, a Saturday, um, if there was no tournament on, we would meet, and there was always a gang of us, uh, we would meet about half past nine Saturday morning at the uh, the YM, we wouldn't leave that building until nine o'clock at night. Um, I'm not saying we had a table tennis bat in our hand all, all day, but we would do two or three hour stints. Then we may go downstairs, have a break and a drink. We would go back up, have another hour, 
go and have a bit of lunch, back up another hour or so. Then we used to go up to the gym and participate in some of the, you know, the, the uh, rigorous training sessions, then back down and <clears throat> just played all day, basically, you know, between the gym and that. Uh, walk out at uh, nine o'clock. Invariably, we would go to uh, one of the little discos on o Oxford Street and uh, John Hilton would uh, show his great prowess when it come to trapping women. Um, and uh, as well as being number one in Europe at one time, it was definitely number one in the YM when it came to uh, attracting the girls. And I can't tell you how many times he's come to me and said, Kino, have you got a minute? These two at the bar. Listen, the blonde, I've been bloody sniffing round her for ages. Can you just go and chat to her mate? And I'd say, oh, come on, John. She's a bag on the head, you know. And, he, <laughs> and John would say, yeah, but just, just, you know, just, just put up with it for a bit and see how I can get on with, with, her, uh, with her mate. But that's what we used to, after we played, you know, went and had a bit of fun, a bit of a laugh. And I should say... We were not drinkers. Yeah. <clears throat> Personally, I never had a, you know, never a touch of alcohol. Uh, we didn't smoke. Um, but uh, anyway, that was that was just our regime. <clears throat> right, Mark, I'll uh, give you a chance to <clears throat> speak to Brian. I'll just go mute. Um, it's obviously trying to, to start a Brian. Obviously, we've got a lot more to hear about your, your table tennis journey. But I just wanted to get your thoughts quite early on. Of, obviously, we're talking about an era of table tennis, which is, is new to me, and it's fascinating to hear about these names. I just had the pleasure to play against John Hilton at a Grand Prix uh, back, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And even for me, it was um, playing against a European champion. But I wanted to get your thoughts on how has table tennis changed over the eras, from the era you're talking about when this practice and to where we are now and being heavily involved in coaching, where do you see the evolution? Where has it gone? Um, I First of all, Mark, I've had difficulty actually um, deciphering exactly what you said there. It wasn't very, very clear. Um, so I think if I've picked you up correctly, I think what you've said is how have I seen the game evolve? Yes. From back in the... Right. Well, yeah, I mean... I. I'm probably of that generation that has seen the, you know, the biggest evolvement of the sport um, because what uh, I came in at the, the early days when the rubber bats, uh, non-sponge bats, were still widely used, yep. And um, so I, I witnessed that. I witnessed the move um, to uh, to the sponge bats. And let me just digress a little bit here, yeah? Um, when I talk about that move from the, the, the hard rubber bats, the old, the old banners, to the sponge. <clears throat> Again, before I had had any interest in table tennis, when I was in Edinburgh, I sometimes used to go to a youth centre off Dulry Road called Orwell House. Yep. And again, that was a two or three storey building which catered for uh, youngsters' interests in a number of sports and various, you know, other uh, leisure uh, activities. But they had a table tennis uh, cent uh, room there. And uh, I remember one night I... I had been going round and I just I just went in and sat down and I could hear there was a major debate going on um, amongst about half a dozen guys and they, they, they had a bat in one of their hands. And this guy was trying to explain how this bat was different to the other bats that uh, these lads had. And the reason it was different was it had introverted rubber. Yep. It was a sponge bat, but the pimples were on the inside. And this uh, guy that had the bat was trying to explain to everybody that because the rubbers are introverted, yep, it enables them, rather than having the pimples, it enables them to be able to spin the ball, yep, 
um, which they couldn't do to the same effect with the, the pimples. And this guy was trying to demonstrate this, what he called the loop. And if my memory serves me correctly, and David may be able to come in here, um, was it Jacobson? Uh, yeah. You're on, Dave, sorry. Yeah, um, right. it is. Yeah, it was Jacobson that yeah. was the guy that actually um, he was the one that was able to um, introduce us all, or if you like, to, in, in a sense, invent this topspin loop shot, yeah? So yeah. That, that, uh, that was that first move away from just the pure pimpled uh, hardback rubber. So the game then um, ran pretty, yeah, pretty well unaffected in terms of the equipment um, for quite a number of years because it went from that early, that 60s, 62, 63, 64 period running right through, um, through the 70s. And I actually believe again that I feel very privileged that I probably had the opportunity to witness the best table tennis that has ever been seen. Because the, those rubbers at that time, um, they, they, they actually enhanced the game. Yeah, and I think that's, the, that's the, the way to describe it. It enhanced it. It gave it a bit more variation from just the hard bats. Yeah. Um, and you then got more a bit of counter hitting, yeah. A little bit, you were top spinning, but nothing like happening now. So there was the, the advancement of top spin was just coming in. It made life a bit more difficult for the hard bat choppers, yeah. But you also got um, players who were able to lob, and in fact, probably one of the greatest um, and the great one of the best lobbers and sort of semi-defensive players that uh, I've ever witnessed and played with was Malcolm Sugden, Scotland's number one. Malcolm was a left-hander. You couldn't hit a ball past Malcolm, right? But he, he we used to call him the Jinsky. Um, so he, he was able to retrieve balls. Doesn't matter, you know, where you put it, Malcolm got to it. And he was a lobber and he was spectacular. The table tennis that Malcolm was involved in, um, you know, was it was um, you know it was really great for for spectators. So what I'm saying is that that period um, I maintain was probably one of the, the 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 best periods of table tennis as a spectacle, and I I recall entering the and David will be aware of the, these tournaments. Uh, Alan Ransom's Tea Sides Open, yep, and I can recall one particular uh, year when the Czechoslovakians were over touring, and there was uh, Stanek Kalarovitz, <clears throat> and the tournament took place on the Saturday, but on the Friday night they would have um, uh, um, an international between Scotland, uh, sorry, um, England and Czechoslovakia. And the England lads were Dennis Neal and Chester Barnes. And of course, Kal Kalarovic and Stanek, who were both top, well, all four of these were top European players. And the table tennis was just mind blowing. The rallies were extensive, you know, backhand, forehand, lobbing, uh, the, the agility, the mobility, um, it had the lot, um, and it, it. What was also noticeable was that there there was a greater degree of control in those days. Um, it wasn't like it is now, where it's just he who gets in wins. Um, you know, with inordinate speed and spin, which has been chemically enhanced with the rubbers. Mm -hmm. So that period, yep, yeah, and again. You know, when I remember watching, you know, having the pleasure of watching some of the world championship matches with uh, guys like Hans. In fact, I played Hans Alser um, in one of my first uh, world championships in Stockholm. And 
that was the the opening night of the 67 worlds scotland actually played against um sweden who were european champions um and probably one of the a game that i'll never ever forget myself playing against alser um i just played out of my skin long rallies um and uh you could never get a ball past this fella uh, and you know the the roar of the crowd supporting him was you know it created a great atmosphere so that as i say i've gone through that period then and uh I alluded earlier there about how it affected the defensive players, yeah? And the rubber back guys were slowly but surely beginning to diminish. They, you know, the extra spin and the, that little bit of speed that they were getting off the, the sponge bats um, was really starting to, uh, to take over. And I mean, again, if, I don't want to preempt. I don't know what else you've got on the cards to talk about, David, but very much so, you know, when I I went up and had the success in the national championships, um, my final match was against a hard bat rubber player, Tommy McMichael. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. If, yeah, that's what I didn't want to. Uh, yeah, that's right, Chris. right. So keeping on this evolution uh, track, um, then what happened, um, as, as we all know, um, we had the introduction of uh, anti-spin, yeah, um, which was designed, obviously, to try and counter the, ex you know, the excessive speed and spin that the guys were getting with the, the sponge bats. Um, and that, uh, that in itself... Um, I don't believe had too much of a detr detrimental effect on the game. Yeah, it probably evened things out a bit. Yeah, and gave defensive players uh, a better chance to be able to compete and uh, you know um, have a bit of success against the 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 sponge bats. Um, and I mean, it has to be said that. Uh, my buddy John Hilton was the man that uh, really changed the game um, forever um, when he won the Europeans. And John, I mean, he was quite, uh, the way that he used the, um, the, the bat between the, um, you know, the anti-spin on one side, combination bat, and just a normal sponge on the other. Uh, I mean, John was actually quite remarkable how he did that. And I have to tell you that in one of the Europeans or the worlds, I can't remember which one, the England captain at the time was Peter Simpson. Yeah, Peter was a great mate of mine. Uh, and as David knows, um, we did a lot of coaching together and I learned a lot from Peter. Um, but Peter was the England captain, and John was playing in a particular match, and he was playing a defensive player, and John was looping, or apparently looping, yep, and this particular game, yeah, it was nip and tuck, and Peter turned to Dougie Johnson. And he said, Dougie, I don't know why he bothers. He gets nothing on that topspin whatsoever, right? He's just wasting his time. He'd be better trying to flat hit. And Dougie, right, this match got to something like 16 all. And Dougie, Dougie looked at him and said, you're joking, aren't you, Pete? He said, why? What do you mean? He said, he's looping with the anti-loop. Simpson said, you what? He said, he's looping with the anti-loop. He said, well, they can't do that. He said, just watch. And then 16 all, 17 all, John turned the bat because the rubbers were the same colour. Yeah. And then a couple of anti spins in the middle of the rally, twiddle, woof, and the ball went over the lights. Yeah. Um, and then, so that was the way that John, if he was playing against defensive players, 
that was the way that he bamboozled them, yeah. But then when he played with the hitters, yeah, he, he did the same thing. He'd counter hit normally, backhand to backhand, um, and then twiddle, same shot, uh, and of course, the opponents, boom, ball, the bottom of the net, yeah. So that, uh, the evolution there was that we had to have different colours. Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, you know, at that point, um, that, again, evened things up. People worked out John and so on. But I have to say, the next step, yeah, in, in many ways, I think, was the death knell of the, of the game in, in terms of being a spectacle. Because when they started using long pimples, it um, it just it very quickly you found that until people I mean it took a while for people to get used to them but very quickly you you found that the game was becoming a bit of a lottery yeah and uh, funnily enough some <laughs> I had a conversation this afternoon. Um, and uh, I think you know the Graham Frankel. Um, yes. yeah. yeah. Well, Graham and I had a conversation over an article I've just written um, for a magazine down here. And he mentioned a guy called Alan Heap, who uh, was a um, British University's champion from Bolton. And Alan had a brother called Clive. Uh, and I can remember vividly, I had never, ever lost to Clive Heap. And I turned up one night to play this guy who was using these long pimples on one side. And it uh, it was just farcical. I hadn't a clue what was happening. And the, um, in in a sense, I mean, as we all know now, it, it reversed all the principles whereby if you chopped, yeah, over the table, it put, reverse the spin the other way yeah uh and so i think once that uh you know once that rubber started getting used widely um that's when the game started becoming this bit of a lottery i have to say um as time evolved um and i and i put this down to my upbringing against, you know, many defensive players. I was very much a control player. Yeah, didn't have a lot of power, but I could bore everybody to death. Um, and what I, what I found was that once I realised that uh, people used long pimples, yeah, I immediately, yeah, when I say immediately, I eventually sussed that what that was doing it was masking a weakness, yeah, because this is what happened. You got lots of players that were just average players suddenly become technically good players, but because of the the um, the um, the confusion that they were causing with these rubbers. But once I had worked out that they had a weakness, I then knew how to exploit that weakness. And so I, as th time evolved, I was very happy to see anybody come on the table with long pimples because I, I knew that I had the control um, to be able to handle them and frustrate them. Um, and usually that is the thing you see. What, they, you, what the long pimple players were used to was winning quick points, winning easy points. But I know because of my particular game, I had the control and the patience and I knew eventually when I dug one heavy over that table, that ball was going to pop up. And so it was bang. You could just, you know, pat it past them. So, um, but that, uh, that evolution, no good, right? Um, I think that, as I say, took us on the slippery slope. And then eventually the, I'm not a scientist, right? But, the chemical enhancement on some of these rubbers with the glue, um, you know, the, the, the speed glue, this, the, the various rubbers that people use now. Um, 
One of the recent magazines I looked at, and I think I've alluded to this to the, I think that article I sent to you, David, I think there were 200 different rubbers um, that, uh, that were being available. And uh, I question how, um, you know, how different every one of these rubbers can be and how they can justify um, you know, pr producing that. So that, uh, you know, a combination there of what we've seen. So at the top, I accept now there's not many, even the long pimples um, have sort of subsided a bit because everybody's out now for all these fast rubbers um, when the ball's never on the table. Um, any YouTubes I turn on to, world top players, three or four point, uh, three or four rat shots over the net, the ball's off. Um, so uh, I'm afraid it, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the 70s was for me, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people, that, that was the period when table tennis was at its best. I mean, let me, if I, if I can even uh, go back to the 70s and just tell you, um, about probably the one of the most fantastic matches or um, events, spectacles that I've ever been involved in was the Scottish Open at Meadowbank. That particular year, I, I, I pretty bit reasonably successful, got through to the final of the mixed doubles with Jill Hammersley um, and the final of the men's doubles. And it was this final of the men's doubles <clears throat> at Meadowbank. I was playing with Malcolm Sugden and we had to play Dennis Neal and Chester Barnes. Yeah. And there's a bit of humour to this. Before the match, uh, we're just knocking up and Dennis came round the table. And uh, I mean, people who know Dennis, they know the way that he talks and his mannerisms. Uh, and he uh, said, Keeney, come here, come here. <clears throat> I said, I'm sorry, what? He said, come here, come here. I said, yeah, yeah, what, what's, what's what, Dennis? He said, you're not going to win. I said, you what? He said, you're not going to win. I said, well, I'm not so sure that we're favourite. I said, but how do you work that out? He said, because I'm telling you, you're not going to win. Can you accept that? I said, come on, finish it off. What else is there? He said, well, Turn round. So I turned round. He said, and he said, he pointed up. Yeah. He said, look at that. He said, what do you see? I said, like, what? Two or three thousand people. He said, exactly. He said, we're going to give them something to talk about when they go home tonight. He said, we're going to give them an exhibition to have them cheering, standing, standing in the aisles and clapping. He said, are you up for it? I said to Malcolm, what do you think? <laughs> And we said, yeah, come on. He said, right, well, we'll win 3-2. Yep. He said, so we'll keep them on the edge of the seats um, until we get to that, uh, the, you know, the, the latter end of the fifth. Uh, I've never been involved in table tennis match like it. Uh, bearing in mind, I've got one of Britain and Europe's best lobbers in Malcolm Sugden. Um, and the rallies were just incredible. And uh, he was right. The crowd went bananas. But, and I nobbled him afterwards. I said, hey, I thought we were going to go to five. He said, I couldn't resist hitting that one at 20, uh, uh, at 2019. He said that it went past you. Um, and uh, it was 3-1 that they beat us. But uh, what, what, you know, it's just absolutely fantastic to have been involved in that and uh, <clears throat> the great thing was that once you took away if you like the the i don't mean the worry but the pressure of trying to win and you know do the right thing um once you took that away and just played with you know great gay abandonment marvelous marvelous so that is when table tennis for me was without question, you know, at its best. Right. Um, 
let's go turn the clock back um, a little bit. And uh, you've been playing in Manchester. Um, you only started in 63, but uh, you come to Scotland and you surprise everybody by winning the Scottish National Championship. Not many people have done that. I was saying to you over the over the last uh, 50 years. And uh, so you travel up. You must have improved a lot in those three years, but but just give us a, a rundown of the day or the night before. Well, it's uh, I think if that was in December ninety six, uh, so nineteen sixty six, yeah. If it just turned the clock back to about April nineteen sixty six, yeah, that was probably one of my first visits to Scotland to play in an event up there, yeah? And it was the Scottish Open in Edinburgh, and I think it was a, a drill hall in Claremont Street. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was the Scottish Open then, and I travelled up with um, my Cheshire County colleagues, Roger Hampson, Derek Schofield and Mike Johns. And Mike was a junior. And on the Friday evening before the Scottish Open, they had a junior international. And that involved um, Mike Johns. And I think it might, it could, oh, Keith Lawrence. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there were three players and it might have been Jeff Salter. Uh, who was uh, another one of them. So these guys, these juniors, they played um, the match on the Friday night. In the tournament, I think it was about the last 16, I had to play Keith Lawrence, who was actually the number one England junior at the time. And I had a fantastic match with Keith. Um, again, I remember I was 2-1 up at one, uh, one stage because it was best of five in them days. I uh, had this re really great match and uh, I lost narrowly in the fifth. Um, and uh, by definition, I wasn't too dis disappointed. I had, you know, made a good fist of it. Uh, and I, it was really at that time when I was beginning to improve and if you like, just trying to establish myself maybe as one of the, you know, the reasonably good players that, uh, you know, was getting a bit of recognition. So the interesting thing is, and there's a, and it was quite humorous, uh, after the match, right, uh, and there's nothing sinister here or naughty, but I went to the toilet and I was stood in the toilet doing what the boys do next to the stone. And I was suddenly aware of this presence at my right hand side. And I turned round and there was this silver haired gentleman in a Scotland blazer, Scotland tie. And uh, he, uh, he turned to me and he said, um, very good match that son. He said, I've just watched you playing. He said, uh, I, thought you, uh, I thought you did very well. You were just about got over the line there because um, he's a top player he is. And uh, I said, you know, I just spoke back and just said, yeah, I, uh, I was uh, I was quite pleased uh, about that. And uh, I said, but uh, there's no shame in losing. And, and he turned to me quickly. He said, is that a Scottish accent? I said, uh, yeah. He said, where are you free? I said, I'm from Edinburgh. He said, well, how do I not know you? I said, well... I've come up from Manchester, Hunter. He said, yeah, but you, you say you're from Edinburgh. I said, yeah. He turned, right, and I'm not even sure that he had zipped his trousers up. This was Harry Baxter, yeah. He turned, was running out, pulling his zip up, shouting, Peter, 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 that wee boy we've just watched, he's, he's Scottish, he's one of us, right? And... Uh, so anyway, that was really my first, um, yeah, if you like, little bit of recognition in Scotland. Um, and then, as you rightly said, um, I then uh, 
decide, well, it was actually Derek Schofield that uh, encouraged me to come up for the Scottish Closed, uh, which was uh, due to be played at Spinburn um, in uh, December 1966. So I decided that I would do it. So I entered the tournament and uh, I came up and I came up and the tournament was on the Sunday and I came up on the Saturday and uh, came along because I think the juniors played on the Saturday uh, and I gave the place a, a bit of a recce and I, I met Eddie Still, who had very kindly, and I, I can't even tell you how it had come about, but Eddie had arranged my accommodation in Glasgow, yeah, and he twinned me that night in this hotel with uh, a, a, a little Labradorian lad called um, Richard Yule, yeah. And uh, so I shared a room with Richard that night and we, we got to know each other and got on pretty well. Richard was three or four years younger than me. Um, and uh, I, you know, we, we wandered along to the tournament at Springburn and the first thing I did when I went in the room was I went across and had a look at the draw. Uh, and I went down, and I, as I'm going all the way down, I cannot see my name. Uh, and I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit panicky, thinking, have, have they missed me off the draw? And eventually I got to the bottom of the draw, and there was my name, second bottom. And I looked at that. And I realised I was playing the number two seed in the first round, a guy called Jim Dow, yeah, uh, who was a prominent international. So I uh, I was a bit disappointed with that, to say the least. And uh, I'd be less than honest if I didn't think that being an Anglo, yep, yeah, could it have been that it just missed uh, my name had just been slotted in there for some reason but that was just at the back of my mind I never voiced that but uh, yeah so I had Jim Dow first round so turned up Sunday morning had a knock with Richard before the tournament started and uh, <clears throat> getting looking at the old clock uh, getting near the time and I'm getting ready to go, there's no gym down. So I'm hanging about and I went to the organisers and they said, and, uh, they said ah, he's, he's not the most reliable son, he, sh he should be here in a bit, don't you worry. And uh, so I'm getting a bit anxious. When you're ready to go, you know the feeling, don't you? Um, and then um, they, they announced, yep, um, Jim Dow, Brian Keane, something, Dow has not appeared and Brian Keane receives a walkover. So I was through to the second round. And then when I inquired what had happened to Jim, Jim was a guy that apparently he liked, um, he liked a little drink. And Saturday night was his uh, favourite time of the week for enjoying uh, his drink. And I'm afraid he had too much that night. Uh, tried to drive his car home, from what I'm told. Had an altercation with the policeman that stopped him. And as I lay in that uh, comfortable hotel uh, with Richard in the twin bed next to me, uh, Jim Dow had, um, he had private accommodation um, at the expense of Glasgow taxpayers in the local Nick, uh, and they had to sleep it off the day after. And so that leads me actually just to digress a little because alcohol, yep, has had an absolutely incredible uh, influence on my life. Had that not happened, yeah, chances are I could have gone out, boom, yep, um, and then never developed in the way that I managed to do. But equally so, I spent nearly 40 years working for a fantastic company, The Guardian newspaper, yep. And the job that I got at The Guardian was because um, it was a, a repping job 
um, on uh, newspaper sales. And I took the job of a guy who lost his license uh, because he uh, fell under the influence of alcohol. And uh, what, event, what actually happened was I was in the offices at the time. We swapped places. He, the company kept him on, gave him my job. I took his. Um, and then, you know, getting that job, I uh, then had a very successful uh, career in newspapers. But uh, so that was the uh, that was the story of getting past Jim Dow. Yeah. And uh, I, I, and honestly, I cannot remember much of what happened after that, other than I, re I can vividly remember the uh, quarter final. And I had to play Peter Cameron, yeah. And uh, Peter, you know, he was he was so difficult to play, um, because of his disability. Uh, he had fantastic touch and control. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but admire him. And one of my, I've always been aware, my weaknesses have been. Been able, I mean, I could, well, I'll come to top spinning against choppers, but any heavy diggers over the table used to cause me a lot of trouble. Yeah, particularly if they, if they were heavy chop diggers, pushers and blockers, yeah, who gave you nothing. I always, I always suffered um, with those. And I have to tell you that that, uh, that was probably one of the most difficult games that I'd uh, um, that I encountered, um, and uh, I I got through it, but very close in the third, and uh, I was quite uh, you know I was obviously quite pleased to get that. So I I found myself then in the semi final. So if we can turn the clock back five years, right when I spoke about seeing Charlie Vesco, yeah. I then had to play Charlie Vesco in the semi-final. And my mentality at the time was that that's it, I've done it. Yeah, because I still held Charlie on a pedestal. Yeah, um, and uh, it was one of those games that I just felt I had nothing to lose. I've got further than I expected. So I was going to go out and enjoy it. Yeah. And we we started off, and Charlie had um, a really good all round game. He chopped a bit, yep. He looked a bit. He, had, he counter hitted backhands, so he had a mix of everything. And it's not it's not being arrogant when I say that about nine or ten points in my mentality changed because I thought I can I can beat this guy he's he does a bit of everything but I can I'm better at the things that he can do and uh, so when he went back to chop I was able to top spin a couple and then killed the forehand when he counter hit it right as he did on his backhand forehand I was I was faster than him right I was quicker and his counter hitting was usually done before going back to chop so I knew that I could, you know I could push him back from the table and got through it and I won the first game comfortably and through the second game and again I can vividly remember I was losing concentration because on the table next to us the other semi-final was going on and Malcolm Sugden was playing Tommy McMichael. And this is coming back to hard bat rubber players. Malcolm's biggest weakness was against choppers. And I always, I always believed that his weakness was because his technique, right, against chop um, was wasn't uh, it wasn't compatible with what you needed to be able to do malcolm played everything with a long arm right 
almost from the shoulder when he was playing against uh, choppers. And I'm losing a bit of concentration because I'd heard all this cheering and roaring on the next table. Yep. And uh, apparently Malcolm had lost the first. Yep. And he was struggling in the second against Tommy. And as I was playing, I couldn't help but keep, as the crowd cheered, I couldn't help but keep looking over. And uh, yeah, I got to about, I seem to remember it was round about 17 all or something in the second. Uh, and then the, the, whole, the whole place erupted um, as Malcolm actually lost to Tommy. And when I saw that, and I had seen Tommy as a hardback chopper, I thought, blimey, I've got a chance here. So I thought, I'll finish this quickly, uh, and then, you know, hopefully I should be... And I, I did finish it quickly, but the trouble is, I missed the bloody ball, uh, and I ended up losing, I think, 17 or 18. So I couldn't get round the table quick enough to start the third, um, and then I got my game head on, and uh, I, I, I got through it, I think, about six or seven in the third. Um, there was just no, no way I was uh, sort of giving up on that. So that put me into the final with Tommy. And uh, Tommy, yeah, good defender, but virtually, I have to say that every, every match I would play... Manchester League, Stockport League, probably Interleagues, and out of maybe seven or eight people in the week that I'd play, four or five of them would be good choppers um, in the Manchester area. So if if I had to loop steady topspin, 10, 15, 20 balls, drop shot, 10, 15, 20, drop shot, that's what we did. And then just wait for the chance and then bang. Um, and so, you know, played Tommy and, uh, you know, it, it would never have happened if Malcolm had won because there's no way I would have beat Malcolm. Um, you know, it, uh, he was just just too good. But So it's interesting the way that everything, um, yeah. everything all has to fall into place, doesn't it? And that was the day that, uh, um, yeah, Mc, McEwen's lager, uh, started it off, and uh, yeah, but uh, Malcolm losing to Tommy, um, and uh, me managing to get past Charlie Vesco. So, yeah, that was how I become Scottish, uh, you know, Scottish men's singles champion. Yeah. Well, you're emphasising here um, some of the golden rules <clears throat> in playing: control, accuracy, and consistency, and. We talked about that last week. So I think, Mark, I think we should give Brian the top 10. You've got to answer them really quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, some of the questions there. So this is a quick fire, Brian. Um, so we've sort of got an idea of your game. But so basically, the first question is spin based, power based, or are you in between the two? Struggling to, struggling to make that out, Mark. <laughs> Spin so, power based. Sorry, say that again. Are you were you spin based or power based or a combination of the two? Neither. Neither. I couldn't have spin. I couldn't have spin the ball very much either. I uh, the the lads the, the I was often referred to as powder puff. Yeah, because yeah, I had no power. Um, I mean, I could kill a ball. Yeah, but. Uh, not like some could, but uh, hey, Mark, you're not allowed to. Wait. I know, I know. So ne next one, what was your most effective or strongest stroke? Um, my strongest stroke initially, initially. Now, and there is a wee again a wee story here, so it's not going to be quick fire. You can't. There's no stories. No, I can't have that. No can't story. Have that. Can't tell right. us what um, in the early days, when I was up there winning that, my strongest stroke was my, my forehand because, uh, you know, I could kill a ball. Um, but eventually, it turned out to be my backhand as I got older. Right. So, so does that mean that when you're least effective or weakest stroke, does that mean that it reversed? 
Yes. So it reversed round as the years yeah, went on. Yeah, it went the other way. Yeah. My, um, yeah, my forehand become a little bit, yeah, uh, a little, not not as fluent, put it that way, stiffened up, but the backhand kept me going for years. Um, from any player, what one stroke you wish you had from them? Any player, the one stroke that I wish I had? Um, a stroke from a player. Good question, that. Good question. I, I would still plump for a Dennis Neal backhand. It just never missed. Never missed. What serve gave you the best success? So your best serve, where would you put it? Um, still serve that I use now. I don't know how you describe this yet. Uh, can you see my hands? Yeah. Yeah. Throw the ball up, bend down, on, bend down on almost get my bum on the floor, bring the bat down behind the back of the ball. Yeah. That roughly that did, but you could vary it. Yeah, you could you. twist the hand over the top and get a bit of spin, or you could chop it. To this day, I can still do that serve, and the number of people straight in the net. Yeah. So that uh, that was uh, always a, a very effective serve. I hate that serve playing against that one. Used to hate that yeah. one. Um, it's difficult now though because my knees they've gone. I, I get <laughs> down, but I can't get back up. The the best server you've ever played against. Oh, uh, Keith Lawrence in oh. the day, Keith because. Right, I know it's quick fire. You remember, David? They used to straight out the hand. Yeah. Can you uh -uh. boom like that? And the ball used to move when it was coming to you. Yep. Um, so these were Lawrence, Mark. Um, the best player you ever played against. Alser, Stanek, and Hilton. Yeah. Um, the victory that gave you the most pleasure? Winning the Manchester Closed. Wow. That may sound odd, but at that time, there must have been six players in that, that championship that would have been in the top 12 in Scotland. No disrespect. I don't wish to be disrespectful, but that's how good these lads were. And to have come through that tournament and want, without question, that had to... I beat Derek Schofield in the final. Good way. Um, yep. Yeah. And yeah. quick fire, gone. Yeah, yeah. So, so no. you've, got to the last, you've got to the last question. But the funny thing is I missed out about three or four because you've answered them throughout the evening. Um, so I'll go to the last question. The player you most admire? Ebby Hard Scholler. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, the 1969 Worlds in Munich. Mm -hmm. Yep. He if I remember rightly, beat Hasegawa, reigning world champion, in the semi-final. Uh, he was just poetry in motion. Yep. Uh, absolute dream to watch. Uh, he had fantastic footwork. He was never rushed. And I learned something from Scholler. If you remember, if you were a, a defensive player, invariably you would step in on your right-hander I'm talking about, and I'm, I'm, sat, I'm sat here demonstrating it to myself this, but you would step in and you would chop as a right-hander with your left foot forward, yeah. correct? And then the opposite for the other side. Right foot forward on the backhand. Scholler, right, the reason that he was so good 
it being able to switch from backhand to forehand was he took everything off his forehand side. So when somebody battered the ball at him, he didn't drop his right leg back to chop. He put his right leg forward and moved into the ball, got max, got maximum uh, backspin onto the ball because he was going to meet it and he was taking it at a higher point. Uh, and by definition, it was going to be uh, that much heavier in the chop. And then even if they then switched it to the backhand, is he was in the right position just to drop his left foot back. So Schuller was magnificent, and he had a five setter in that uh, that event. And within half an hour, he had to go back on to play the final against Shigeo Ito, yeah, yeah. yeah the Japanese, and he lost to Ito. But uh, I'd have to say. The nearest to him was Liang Ke Liang, the Chinese chopper. He was everything that Scholler was, he wasn't. He was all action. Everything looked spectacular. Where Scholler, right, was just, he was control personified, right? Cool, calm, everything, you know, just exactly, um, you know, to the book. Fantastic player. Well, have we had any, got any YouTubers? Um, do you know what, Brian? You've covered off a lot of the questions. It's worth giving a mention about what yeah. you've covered off already. So Graham Stevenson, at what the question about your article about rubber restrictions and um, that's been covered off. Uh, with questions about obviously your story about when you started and things like that, from Ben Hart, who's back this week, Dave. Good, so it's good. good to have Ben back. Um, so, no, I mean, there isn't, I mean, without sort of repeating yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. what Brian sort of said already, um, right. we've sort of covered off these questions. Okay, so, Brian, uh, we started with a forest connection. Tell us about the Sean Connery connection. Ah, yeah, Sean Connery. Um... My dad was a bit of a chancer, right? He he would spin yarns that, uh, you know, were just outrageous. And, you know, we often used to be saying to him, oh, come on, dad, that, that, that's ridiculous, you know. So he was always up for telling us a story. And again, it would have probably been 1960, 61, something like that. We were watching a black and white... Uh, program on television which was involved teddy boys yeah and in the middle of this my dad said blimey he didn't say blimey actually but uh, I'll uh, I won't use the the language but anyway he uh, he said that's my van laddie and we looked at him and said, what do you mean your van laddie that laddie there him on the telly he was my van laddie a couple of years when I worked at the store on the milk. And of course, we said, oh, give over, Dad, another one of your stories. How would you, how, well, how would you ken anybody on telly, right? And he shouted, Mary, Mary, come here, come here. Hey, look at that, where's that? And she looked at the television and she said, oh, Christ, ah, your dad's right, that's Tommy. And... Uh, I said, Tommy, he said, yeah, Tommy Connery. He said, Christ, you're right enough. Ah, you're right. That is him, Tommy Connery. And uh, so that, that was that particular night, yeah. Uh, and then as time evolved, yeah, suddenly that Tommy become Sean Connery, yeah. And my dad actually taught him to drive. Yeah, they worked on the milk. Uh, I can't remember how, how long uh, they worked on the milk. And apparently um, when they, they had a particularly bad day with the weather, um, they would stop off at home and my mother would dry their clothes in front of the fire, give them a bowl of soup before they went back out. And, 
and the story has it that I've, uh, he sat me on his knee when I was a little and and uh, yeah so uh, yeah that uh, that was the the thing and my dad uh, he's um, he he gets uh, a mention in his uh, autobiography um, the uh, the great Scott but. Um, he got a bit uh, disillusioned when he was on the milk, did uh, Sean Connery, because he he wanted to advance and get his own round, but he only wanted it, according to my dad, if he got a, a, a lorry, yeah? But all they were prepared to offer him was a horse and cart. Um, and my dad said, well, you've got to take that. That's what I had to start with before you can start driving the, uh, you know, the big lorries. So he uh, he said, "Ah, oh, no, I'm not having that," and off he went. Um, and I think he went off to do some French polishing and various other things until he appeared as a teddy boy on this uh, on this program. So that's the Sean Connery collection. The Great Scott and Tommy Keane um, is uh, is mentioned on quite a few pages. Okay, right. Um, you've become the. You've, uh, is, is, you've actually covered uh, not only the questions on YouTube. You've actually sort of knocked a few off my list here. Um, so I'm now going to go. Are you to, saying I talk too much? <laughs> now I'm going to talk about. Oh, I'm going to ask you. Uh, when I first met you, Brian, it was at Lee Green. Yeah. 45 years ago, and you were the lead coach along with the Simpson. Incredibly fit. You used to do all the warm ups, you used to set a fantastic standard. I admired you, I learned from you. Um, you became Peter Simpson's right hand man. Uh, how did you get into coaching? I think it was by accident, like everything else, by accident, wasn't it? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, I think if. Most players would tell you that at some point, um, when they were known to, you know, to be playing to a re sort of reasonable standard, that they might get asked to go along and, uh, you know, do a little bit of coaching, you know, whether it's a youth club or a school and uh, and so on. And um, I, uh, yeah, I similarly so. I got asked to if I was interested in going to a school in South Manchester, Flixton, actually, um, just to, uh, they were wanting to develop table tennis there. And as it happened, it was a girls' school. And uh, so I uh, I went in there and did, uh, you know, a wee bit of coaching there. And in interestingly, um, I had about 30 or 40 of these, uh, these girls. And... Um, you eventually, you, a little bit of self-taught, you, you have to try and keep everybody involved. So um, you, you have to set up little games that uh, allows them all to keep involved and um, a lot of you know, mobility and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was there that um, once I, uh, it, after... What you'll always find is you'll always get a few dropouts, yeah, as time goes on. And I, I found at that girls' school, I ended up with about a dozen that were turning up every week. Um, and so there were th half a dozen of those that um, were pretty keen and had, the, had their own bats. And so I started helping them with their technique. And one of those uh, young girls was a girl called Christine Hancock, yeah. And uh, I got quite close in the nicest possible way to Christine and two of her mates, uh, um, uh, Helen Garrett. Uh, and I started taking them down to Gatley YM on a Sunday afternoon um, because we used to have just an open house there. We had the match room, one table. We had the open room with uh, about four or five tables. Started taking them down to there and I started helping them. Um, and uh, eventually those two girls just went through the ranks and uh, they played for Cheshire. Uh, one of them fell by the wayside, made the biggest mistake of her life when she met 
my housemate, a guy called John Hilton, and she ended up marrying him. Yeah. Uh, and when Hilton told me that he was going out with her, I said, Hilton, let me tell you now, if you ever do that girl any harm, I will cut you to ribbons. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that, uh, yeah, so that was how I, it was that sort of thing. It just, I just slipped into it gradually. Um, and the Stretford uh, Sports Centre, you will know, um, David, uh, when that first opened, I just popped along on spec one day um, to, and I, I got talking to the manager to just to have a look at the building and ask him what would be, you know, what sort of stuff was going on. And, you know, they had the sports hall, badminton, five-a-side, squash courts, uh, uh, but for gymnasium. And I asked him about table tennis. He said, well, we've not really thought about that yet. And, uh, I, and I said to him, well, listen, I'm involved with uh, Cheshire County. Uh, and, you know, we're always looking for places to train. And the shop, the, you know, the bottom line is, I said to him, if, if you can get some tables, I'm sure I could fill this at the weekends. Uh, and in fairness, the guy went out, bought 10 tables, um, I then um, got went back to the lads and said, "Listen, we've got, I can get this every once a month, every Sunday. Um, let's use it for practice." And then the word grew, yeah. And we ended up um, that people were coming. And this is where I met my wife. She came up, Keith Smart uh, brought yeah. Karen up to Dar uh, from Derby. And we, we had is about 100 people turning up on Sundays. Uh, we had to make uh, entries then after that. Um, and I just gradually did more and more of the coaching. But, uh, you know, it was easy because I'd say to people like Mike Johns, Roger Hampson, Nigel Eckersley, I want you there, be there. Because going back to how we learned at the YM, looking at good players, my belief was if I can get all the good players there, yeah, and everybody's watching them. That will inspire them, um, and uh, from that we, uh, you know, we got. I mean, I can recall two or three youngsters that started that way, uh, and then gradually um, got into it and played county and so on. So that was my gradual, in uh, you know, introduction to coaching. Right. Well, I'm really interested in, and I'm, I'm sure the viewers are, and um, I was chatting to Richard Yule, as I said in my introduction, you were one of the pioneers to developing modern coaching in Scotland. Now, we are running out of time, but I really would like you to spend a few minutes saying, you know, how you um, instilled coaching in Scotland, and um, yeah, you left a big legacy. Um, well, to be honest, it, I mean, again, I think we've both agreed that we learned a lot from Peter Simpson. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, probably the, the, the bit that, um, yeah, the, the bit that I, if you like, special, specialized in was that the, the coaching and training had to be, um, it had to be rigorous, yep. Uh, it had to be hard work. And so uh, I, I was very strong on technique to start with, yep. Get the technique right. And then get, uh, once you got the technique right, it was then very much about the physical aspects for me so that you, you you could have the best technique in the world, but you needed to be there. You needed to get to where you needed to be. So the a lot of the 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 work that we did was was off the table as well. Yep, um, doing a lot of movement exercises and uh, just trying to speed up footwork, uh, doing a lot of skipping, things like that. Um, and then, but equally so. Uh, 
I all, always took the view because of my upbringing in match play, yeah, and this is where I, I still think there is probably too much what I call theoretical stroke production stuff going on. The game ain't played like that, yeah. Sure, you've got to get your all the technique right, but then you've got to create random situations. Um, and uh, a lot of the coaching or the training that we did was random, yeah. Um, so that it, usual sort of stuff, backhand to backhand, yeah. But you've got to switch within within five shots. One, two, switch. One, two, three, switch. One, switch. Yeah, so that you were always having to react. Um, so, and then that I then believe that we had to build in match play. Yeah, um, because as I said there, the game ain't played in patterns. Um, it's, you know, you've got to be able to build these strokes into match situations. Uh, and if somebody's feeding you, you can hit four hands all day long. Yeah. Um, I I did have actually an interesting um, little thing arise about 18 months ago down here. I, I work in one particular school, I, well, I work in a couple of schools, but one particular school that I work in, Altrincham Grammar uh, in South Manchester. I'm working now with these kids in these last two or three years who are all using these faster bats, yeah? I try to instill on them that they've got to use bats with control. Um, and what I, I was finding again was that the, the basic control was not there. The technique was okay, right? But mistakes. And I just kept plugging away consistency, consistency, get the technique right first and get the control. I had two young lads who I actually got them playing for the county, but I'd heard one particular day that they were going to see another coach. Um, you will know Amiriel Hussan, the uh, England ranked junior. His dad, Kamal, um, is a player more than a coach. Kamal does a lot of one-to-one -one with uh, players. And these two lads, um, Kabir and Karan, had gone up to see uh, um, Kamal. And let me at this stage say that I'm not a possessive coach. I think one of the big problems we have is coaches become too possessive. And I believe that table tennis is like any other sport. You've got specialists in different areas, yep. And Kamal and myself are probably, I would say, a good combination because I work on the control. And once they've got that, Kamal develops the faster stuff, the speed, yeah. So I'm a big believer in that you get coaches with different skill levels to help bring players on. So these two lads went to Kamal. And I said, uh, why have you gone there? You know, what, what do you feel you're getting that you don't get here? And they said, well, we find that all we ever do is just these sort of con consistency things. Whereas Kamal gets us into top spinning and big backhand loops and so on and so forth. And I said, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, eventually, yeah, you need that. I said, and do you think... You, you, you're ready for that? They said, well, yeah, yeah. I think we, you know, I think we are. We've been doing this now for quite a while. I called the room to a halt. I shouted, let. And I think I had six tables, seven tables at the time going. Two people on every table, six tables going. That's right. I had a seventh table free. I said, right, guys. I said, what I want you to do I want you to take two or three paces back from the table. Yep. I want you then to play 50% pace. No, no power, no speed, 
50% pace. And I want you to hit the ball back and forward. I don't want you to hit any more than two backhands or two forehands simultaneously without moving round. Yep. And what we're going to do, we're going to do 40 over the net without a mistake. Yeah. And when we've done 40, we'll see if we can do 60. That's it. Kabir, Karan, are you okay with that? So they went on and there's another, a young guy that helps me called Adam Thompson. Uh, you may not know Adam, but he's part of the British Disability Squad. Played for England as a disability lad. Um, and he's somebody that I, if you like, mentored from an early age. So Adam and I went on table number seven and I shouted, everybody ready? They said, yes. I said, when you've done it, bats on the table, stop. So off we went. Adam and I, I think within a minute and a half to two minutes, we've done it. No mistakes. First time, boom, 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 done. Put the bats down and just watched. And we watched. And we watched. And then after about 10, 15 minutes, uh, probably 15 minutes, I said, right, guys, let. And I turned to Kabir and Karan. I said, that is why we do what we do. If you cannot get the ball consistently on the table, yeah, when you're under no pressure, you're going nowhere. So that, uh, you know, that was the, so that's what I do with um, a lot of these youngsters. And then, and it's something that uh, you remember, Katie Parker, of course. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I'm, Katie, we're just about out of time. Yeah. Right. It's been fantastic. But I, I would like, Mark, have you got a last question? Because I want to finish with a question for Brian. Have you got a last question for Brian? Um, yes, Brian. I wanted to to ask the influence of a sort of a good table tennis club. Um, so you sort of mentioned earlier, I'll try and sort of wrap it up, but you talked a bit earlier about your early days about table time, okay? And being able to access a table from nine o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Um, I mean, my, my observation on modern day table tennis, it's a lack of table time for players, not putting hours in. Um, so it's maybe the influence of table tennis clubs you've been involved in where how can we get that into younger players of that, that importance of um, that time on that table and almost what, what's stopping us? Because I think it's more difficult to get time on the table now. So it's almost almost from your experience, how can we come together to ensure kids getting involved in the game, get that time on the table? You know, um, $64,000 question mark. The, the lack of clubs, the setup that we have at the moment um, isn't conducive to being able to develop and coach youngsters because I can't put a, a figure on it, but I would suggest that 85% of the clubs that uh, are registered with certainly Table Tennis England are probably league clubs using one table and that table being shared by five or six teams. Yep. The answer is facility, facility, facility. That's one, that's one of the, 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 the major issues. The other issue now is that we are so protective of our youngsters, rightly so, that we virtually have to ferry them everywhere to get to venues. David, there's a couple of youngsters that then um, from Morecambe, yep. My memory's gone. I know them so well, but my memory's gone. I can't remember their names. 
But the two youngsters from Morecambe, their, mo their mother, two or three times a week, drives them to Phil Vickers' club at Draycott, yeah, two or three times a week to get the practice. Now, that ain't the answer. No. And unless we get um, affordable venues, in that article I've written, I've mentioned the fact that I think it's criminal that at four o'clock, schools will close down and there will be empty sports halls, gymnasiums, assembly halls that uh, are lying empty. And these, and I mean, I think I also have to say that table tennis, unfortunately, um, you've got my article, I think, David, I sent it. Brian, are we able to reproduce that on our Table Tennis Scotland website? Uh, absolutely. Good. Yeah, re re produce it in its entirety. Um, it has been published now yeah. in uh, the Table Tennis Times, yeah. um, which is run by Harvey and Diane Webb. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've had some feedback today from uh, a number of people. Um, Peter Charters has come back saying some nice things. Uh, um, Graham Frankel, Brian Wright, you remember Brian Wright? Many years ago, England International. Uh, yes, please do, because this, you know, this is, the, there's a lot of things need to change yeah. um, Brian, if we're going to develop. Brian, we're going uh, uh, we, to, we've, we've gone over, and I'm pleased we have, because you've covered the importance of table hours, from nine in the morning till nine at night, you've, been, you've covered those five things you need to play table tennis, self-control, ball control, can't control yourself, then you've got no chance. Then you've got to control the ball, which you're saying. Then you have to control the table. And then eventually you've got to control your opponent as you did in the semi-final and the final of the national close. Brian, it's been a pleasure. Um, uh, we've covered so much and I'm sure we could go on for another hour or two but um, we've, 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 out, uh, we've outstayed our welcome I'm pleased we have it's been a real pleasure Mark I'm sure you would agree it's, it's been um, it's been eye opening isn't it again it's been a fantastic session and Brian Keane can I, can, can I just can I just finish quickly with one regret one, One little regret that Malcolm Sugden, Richard yeah. Yule, Eric Sutherland and myself didn't stay in Scotland because nice. it would have been our greatest wish to have been able to put into the game in Scotland what probably has happened down here. That's my one regret. Oh, well, you've still got time to put that right, Brian. So, everybody on YouTube, thanks for tuning in. And Brian, you're welcome up here anytime. We'd like to see you at a coaching session. And um, thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. All the best, guys. Okay. As we say down here at our age, keep taking the tablets. Brilliant. Brilliant.